check it out. I am wearing a sweater that is not gold and I have matching lipstick. It's almost like there are other colours in the world. Who knew? Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the Knitting Vicariously podcast. My name is Caroline, I'm found more commonly across Instagram and Ravelry as Dunderknit. If this is your first time joining us on the podcast, hello and a massive welcome to you. A very quick word of warning to say that this is a swearing friendly podcast and therefore if swearing or cursing are generally not for you, I wanted to let you know just because on this podcast, generally, swearing, cursing, they are all things that are embraced, if not indeed gently encouraged. So if it's not your bag, thank you so much for checking us out. This probably isn't going to be the podcast for you. And uh, yes, I hope you find something that you like. For all you wonderful people who are coming back to the podcast once again, hello, I hope you're all tremendously well. As ever, I want to say a massive thank you to every single one of you for watching the podcast, and particularly to those of you who have commented both on last week's episode and previous episodes. I'm having a huge amount of fun with this podcast, and while I would be entirely delighted to be doing all of this here on my Todd, it is just fucking amazing to know that we're starting to build and to grow a community of phenomenal people who are just incredibly excited about taking this idea of knitting vicariously and starting to see where we can go with it. So thank you all so much. Between being on the receiving end of your support, your positivity, and seeing the enthusiasm that I have for anything shared amongst you and amplified because of you, it's just genuinely brilliant. So thank you all so much, whether it's you watching the podcast, whether it's commenting, whether it is perhaps joining in on some of the cows that I'm going to touch on momentarily, whether it is taking this podcast and recommending and sharing it with others, Thank you so much for that. Um, if you've joined us already over on the Knitting Vicariously Ravelry group, I wholly, wholly appreciate it. That group can be found on Ravelry just by searching for Knitting Vicariously in the Ravelry groups tab. Similarly, you can come and join us over on Instagram where there's a raft of hashtags for you to choose from. Um, but all in all, I just, I so appreciate the time that you take to step in, to sit down with me once every week or so and just have an opportunity to, to share our thoughts and get some knitting done, whether it be actual or vicarious. As ever, I always like to take a chance to say a very special thank you to those of you who have shared this podcast a little bit more widely, whether it is you posting pictures of you watching it over on Instagram. It's always a uh, delight to see those of you enjoying it. It's always fine to see my giant face, <laughs> but um, I'm very, very happy that you're taking some positivity from it. Um, for those of you who've shared it in Instagram stories, thank you so much for that as well. And as ever, I just like to take a chance to say thank you very much to anyone who shared it on a podcast. And so on that note, I want to say a really massive thank you to Barbara this week of the Knitting I Love podcast. Barbara is based over on Ireland. She has a fantastic podcast that is full of all sorts of amazing designs that she's made. She is incredibly creative and has some really wonderful designs. The projects that she knits are beautiful and her designs even more so. And so between that and the fact that she's also extended her amazing creativity into having a shop as well, where you can purchase stitch markers and needle pouches and uh, Barbara's podcast is a really, really brilliant one. And so if you haven't already had the opportunity of checking it out, I highly, highly recommend that you go over and do so. And I will pop a link to her podcast in the description box below. We kicked off our knit along towards the end of last week, starting on Thursday, the 15th of November. The hashtag blame Dunder knit along is an opportunity for you to take all of those projects, those patterns, those yarns, that until now you'd only ever had a chance to play with vicariously and to turn those into actual knits. Indeed, any guilt you may feel by casting those on whilst you're in the midst of gift knitting, of obligation knitting, or maybe you're just slogging your way through some whips that have been on your needles for a rather long time, whatever guilt you may be feeling, allow me to absolve you of that. For all that it's called a knit along, it is in fact pretty inclusive. You can knit, you can crochet, you can weave, you can spin. Essentially, if it is yarny related and you really, really, really want to do it, 
feel free. The only stipulation really with this cowl is you must have started or cast it on after Thursday the 15th of November and as I mentioned we'll be running this until the end of January so as long as you've cast it on within those two dates you are good to go. More information about the knit along can be found over on the Ravelry thread in the Blamed Under Knit Along chatter thread in particular. It is a fantastic thread full of bright engaging conversation, lots of very enviable projects and project ideas and it is of course one of many ways that you can win a prize through this knit along. I say many, three one of three ways that you can win a prize within this knit along, the other being within the FO thread and lastly with the Blame Dunder Knit Along hashtag over on Instagram. And in terms of those prizes I will be sharing those with you in the coming weeks but I'm really really excited with how they're starting to come together. I'm going to be featuring a number of makers, my favourite makers that I've shown in previous episodes and the prize packages themselves, they're looking like they're going to be pretty hefty. So I am very very excited about having an opportunity to share those with you as the cow continues. Obviously though the prizes themselves are only one reason for us to actually be taking part in this cal and the main thing is to have an opportunity to knit in reality on something that you've been thinking about and lusting after for a good long while. So your ability to go and to cast on with complete impunity because I am of course taking all of the blame for you, um, that's really the main reason for taking part in the cal itself. Later on in this episode we're going to be taking a look at some of the things that you have been working on, give me a chance to be nosy and essentially I've just been really fucking enabled by some of the things that you guys are working on already and so I need to share that with others. Um, but um, it's great, it's just been this like virtuous cycle of enablement all across the board and I'm delighted for one to be taking part in it. This is my third week of using my fancy schmancy camera to try and record. A couple of you mentioned last time around the lighting and were a little bit disappointed that these two cubbies in particular perhaps weren't being presented to quite their exceptional um, beautiful standards and were getting a little bit dark and a little bit lost in all of the colour. I will say I'm having a bit of a struggle with lighting at the moment. I do have two really very big um, artificial lights in here to try and light the whole um, wall behind me as well as me and my giant face and I'm just struggling a little bit because my craft room does face um, away from the sun in the afternoons and afternoons and evenings are really the only time I have to record. Indeed for the most part probably evenings where there is zero light apart from these bad boys um, I'm just going to struggle to get quite the level of um, ambient lighting that I would like so please please do bear with me in the coming dark darker weeks and months until hopefully we'll be able to see this in brilliant sunshine once again. We can but hope. Right, enough of this prattling on, let's get into the podcast proper. As ever, we're going to be taking a little bit of a jaunt through my actual knitting, starting with what I am wearing and moving into finished objects. Plural. I know, I'm as shocked as you. And after that we'll be moving into works in progress before we then take a look at vicarious knitting. I have a couple of patterns to share with you this week as well as a chance to take a look at what some of you have been knitting for our knit along. So um, yes, as ever, show notes will be in the description box below as well as in the episode thread for this episode over on Ravelry. As ever, you can find us in the Knitting Vicariously group on Ravelry, which you can find by searching for Knitting Vicariously in the Groups tab. You can also find us over on Instagram. I do have the Knitting Vicariously Instagram account, which I use exclusively for um, each of the different episodes. I will put up a list of all of the individual Instagram hashtags for the projects that we cover, as well as the Instagram tags for any of the makers that we cover. And hopefully then you will be able to find them a little bit more easily. As I have mentioned in previous weeks, that Instagram account is very much a kind of a one-way channel through which I can just pass on some of their details to you. If you want to get hold of me or if you'd like to speak to me properly, you're far better off trying my actual Instagram, my personal Instagram account, which is Dundernit. And just to be clear, that is Dundernit without an S because, to paraphrase Jane Eyre, I am no verb. And so without any further ado, let's make a start on actual knitting and in particular what I am wearing this week. What I am wearing this week is Siri by Linnea Oman. 
sorry if I butchered that, really sorry. This is a pattern that you will probably have seen many times over on Ravelry. It's a, pat it's a pattern that's actually designed as a cardigan. I chose to knit it as a pullover. It's not really that sort of high a level of difficulty or, or witchcraft in that this is a steaked cardigan that it's written as, so all I'm really doing is being lazy and missing out the whole steaking part. <laughs> Um, all I did with this pattern to modify it was to look at the chart as she had it. She had a section down the front, which is obviously where you knit the stitches that you would use to then later cut, having reinforced those steaks. I omitted the extra stitches in between and instead just knit it as a pullover. It's really not that complicated. But um, I did knit this out of Madeleine Tosh, Tosh Merino DK, in the brilliantly vibrant and just exceptionally obnoxious <laughs> um, espadrilles colourway, which as you can see is such a beautiful kick-ass coral that is causing my camera to have some issues with <laughs> understanding both the colour I'm wearing and the myriad of colours also behind me. Let me do my usual stand up and give you a little bit of a show around. And here we have the Siri boobies. Yay! Um, this, as I mentioned, I modified it to be a pullover, but Siri has this incredibly textured yoke, and it is all made up through um, twisted stitches and through some textured stitches um, with increases and decreases, and essentially, it's just really, really clever. I kind of love it. Um, ordinarily, you would find this knit out of slightly hardier wool, um, but actually it can be knit out of just about anything. Single ply was perhaps more of a, of a challenge, just because obviously you need to be able to get your needle in and out of some of the twisted stitches with the texture, and single ply, given it isn't twisted quite so tightly as some of the other um, options that you have available, it was a little bit more challenging to get my needle in and out, but using a particularly spiky needle, a sharp and stabby needle, such as a higher, higher sharp, will do you just fine. So I knit this, as you can see, three quarter length sleeves, and it is mid hip length as ever, although you could never quite see that because I'm not quite that tall. But let me just show you the yoke patterning goes all the way around to the back. And yeah, I'm just really, really pleased with it. I've also, I've got a folded over collar. So if you can see that there, what I did was I lit an, uh, knit an extra specially long collar section, folded it over and then just did a three needle bind off here on the inside. But um, yes, let me sit back down, I'll talk you through it. This is the problem with being so pasty white, is you can either have my face or the colours in the background, not both. <laughs> and so today we've got a fairly bright white just luminescent face coming at you and a few of the colours in the background. It's just, it's so hard. Anyway, back to the sweater, which is also probably not helping with the whole colour balance situation given it is obnoxiously bright. But um, as I mentioned, yes, I chose to knit this out of the single ply yarn. It did give me a little bit of a headache with some of the twisted stitches, but for the most part, it actually worked really well. It has stood up fairly robustly. It is not uh, anywhere near as pilly as I thought it would be. This sweater has had a fair bit of wear. Um, I knit this for EYF earlier on in the year. This sweater, it only took me, I think, just over three weeks. Let me double check that. Not even three weeks, this took me two weeks to knit. Um, and so it is top down, you start at the um, back here, there are some really, really great notes on Ravelry that another user who is linked in my pro in my project page, um, she had put up an extra chart to help you add in some short row shaping at the back of the neck, just to make sure that the back of the neck was reasonably nice and high, as you can see there, um, without losing any of the chart, and so she'd added in some extra stitches there. I worked that section and then obviously joined here at the front, or rather, no, sorry, I joined it first and then worked the short rows, and then carried on down for the rest of the yoke. But um, essentially, other than knitting this as a pullover, there's not a huge amount that I did differently from the pattern. The pattern already has a little bit of shaping in at the waist. I may have added in a couple of extra increases just to make it a little bit more flowy around the stomach and the bottom because as we all know, that's never a bad thing. But um, 
and I probably did some decreases of my own devising here on the sleeves just because that's the way I roll but other than that it was all pretty straightforward. I did as I mentioned have to use a slightly stabbier needle than my Chagos. Um, I think I ended up reverting to a higher higher sharp for the yoke itself but other than that it was all pretty straightforward. This took, I think I only had five skeins of the espadrilles. Espadrilles is such an incredible colour and at the time, it had been discontinued by Madeleine Tosh. I've mentioned this with colours previously, that some of my favourites always seem to end up being discontinued, and this was definitely one of those. Um, this was actually a series of skeins that I bought from Loop in London. Loop is a fantastic LYS that's based over in Islington, and um, I bought these, gosh, a number of years ago now, and finally got round to working with them earlier on this year. And in working with them, I was able to squeeze this pullover out. This is knit in the size XL. So I was able to squeeze this whole pullover out in under five skeins. And that is, let me just double check, a smidge over 1100 yards or just over a thousand meters. So yeah, pretty impressed by that. Definitely a good reason to have three quarter length sleeves rather than the full length sleeves. Not sure I would have eked quite that much out. But um, other than that, I really do love this sweater. And as some of you may remember, I bought, when I was over or heading over to the US, I bought another sweater's quantity of the Tosh Merino DK, so the same base as this in the Kenobi colorway, which is this yarn here, to knit another version of the Siri. So literally copy and paste exactly what I've done here. Same modifications, same amount of yarn that's sitting over here in this cubby hole. And Kenobi is this lovely gorgeous grey with a slight sort of mint wash to it, or indeed mint with a grey wash to it. You will remember that Mint and I are not quite the friends that I would love us to be, and so I'm hoping, just maybe, I'm hoping this might be a combination of mint and grey that I can get away with, but um, I think having one of those in this colour is going to be absolutely stunning. I do have a reasonably complete project page for this over on Ravelry and so if you would like to know anything more about this sweater and how I knit it please do head on over there and have a look but if you have any further questions let me know or have a look through some of the other projects because it's a great pattern it's been around for a while but there are some really inspiring FOs off the back of it. So yes this is my Surrey pullover. Next up we will move along into FOs and the first of two, I know, finished objects I have for you this week is still a little bit damp but it is my sparkling cider hat and this is a hat that I am test knitting for the wonderful, the lovely, the just truly and utterly inspirational Kristen of the Vine podcast, also of Vine Yarns. She had mentioned that she was um, looking for test knitters for a new sparkling cider hat that she had designed and I very, very gamely put up my hand and said, yes, please, very much, please, I would like to do this for you. Um, so this is her pat hat pattern. It's due to come out later on this month. I heard mumblings that there might be something out in time for Black Friday. I'm not sure, I will have to confirm that for you, but definitely keep your eye on Kristen's Instagram page and um, you'll hopefully find out a little bit more about it over there. But just so you can see, this is her hat pattern. It is um, a combination of fingering weight yarn, so my case sock yarn that's held together with mohair. I will show you momentarily the colors that I have used, but it has these tiny, tiny little beautiful twisted stitches and cable patterns um, on here or little tiny cables that form these little trees um, that you can just see through the glorious halo, glorious, of the mohair as well. Um, a little bit of ribbing on the bottom up to the crown decreases here at the top. And um, yeah, it's such a pretty, pretty pattern. So let me just show you the two yarns that I used. I mentioned this on last week's podcast because I managed to get this done in just a little bit over a week, but I was using two yarns. The first of these was House of Alamode over here in uh, their 
uh, it's an 8020 sock yarn. I can't remember what the name of the base is specifically, but it is their 8020. And this is in the Redmond colorway. It's a fantastic mix of greens, of blues, of greys, of these tiny little ochre spots as well. And the colorway is Redmond. Redmond is a color that's exclusive to a yarn story in Bath, which again is a fantastic LYS that if you are in the area, you should definitely, definitely visit. Um, the other yarn I was holding it together with was the Ching Fibers Mohair, it is their Q Mohair in the Dark Forest colorway. And again, it is deep, it is moody, it is incredibly saturated, and these two together just work really wonderfully. As you can see, I think I used up around about half a skein of each, maybe a little bit less than half of the uh, mohair in particular. But um, I'm really, really pleased with how this has turned out. And for all that it is still a tiny bit damp post blocking, I will put it on for you and let you see. This is gonna be the first time that I've tried it on as well. So we're all very excited today. So let's just, I pop this on from you. You will see, I knit um, the larger of two sizes. It does come in two sizes, but I am known for having a slightly larger bonce than many. I take it as a compliment. Um, but this, as you can see, it's just so pretty. It is wonderfully cozy. It comes down exactly onto the ends of my ears just to make sure that my head is nice and cozy. And it's just, it's so soft, it's so fluffy. Again, with the mohair that I'm using here and the mohair that I've used previously in other projects, um, I think whether it's the combination of silk and mohair, whether it is just the fact that mohair has moved on leaps and bounds since the um, scratchy, terrible stuff that I remember from the 80s and the early 90s, this is so incredibly soft on my head. I'm normally someone who's slightly sensitive to perhaps slightly more prickly wools. This is giving me precisely zero prickles, so to speak, and is just lovely and cozy. So I highly recommend if a, a mohair hat is on your agenda for this winter, keeping an eye out to have a look and see when Kristen's pattern comes out. I will have a few extra notes on my project page once that pattern has been released. But yes, until then, ah, start getting those yarns ready because it's just such a beautiful pattern. I really enjoyed knitting it. All right, hats off a clock. Ah, yeah, that was, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Oh, this is a strong look we've got going on here at the front. Nice. The second finished object I have for you this week, you've never even seen. Because I hadn't cast these on before the start of the podcast last week. And uh, I managed to get them finished in a matter of days. But it suddenly occurred to me, what I was really going to need for winter was going to be a pair of fingerless mitts. And of course, you're sitting there, you're thinking to yourself, well, Caroline, back in an earlier episode, you showed us the Wishmaker mitts that you've been working on. So clearly, <laughs> I mean, clearly the obvious thing would have been just to finish those, right? Yeah. Yeah, that 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 would have been one idea. That would have been fine. Um, tell you what, an alternative would be to cast something new on and power through it, much like these here. <laughs> Can you tell maybe which route I took? <laughs> but um, these are now... I am not sure if these are pronounced Belisa or Belusa. I feel like one's Norwegian, one's Danish, but it could be that one's gobbledygook and the other is too. Who knows? My pronunciation is just ridiculous. But um, these are mittens that I will put the name of them up here on the screen along with the picture from Isolde's site. They are designed by Isolde Teague. They're one of her patterns from her Knitworthy collection many years ago and um, I just I really really like them. Now I have made some modifications. I will talk about those momentarily but I just want to take a chance to show you how pretty they are. Look though. Look, they're so festive. Um, 
Obviously, there are a raft of designers out at the moment, none least of which is Ellie of Skein Gear, who is designing some incredible patterns and selbu mitts and all sorts of just glorious handwear and other wear as well with some of these incredible um, traditional patterns and colour work on them, which I really do appreciate. My only reason for choosing um, the Isolde pattern over and above one of Ellie's is the majority of Ellie's patterns are full mittens and I am someone who I am definitely in need of having quick and easy access to my fingers, keep your minds out of the gutter, um, when it comes to my winter hand knits in particular, quite literally on my hand. Um, I'm someone who I'm addicted to my phone. I do find that when I remember having gloves and so on from when I was little, the number of gloves that I would end up losing because I take them on and off so frequently to be able to use my hands, um, I just, I'm now at the stage where I know that full mittens, they just don't work for me. So I wanted to be able to create some fingerless mitts and as old as pattern was um, probably closer to what I was looking to try and get now. Isolde's pattern, as you will have seen from the picture that I put up, actually deviates slightly from these. So it has the little individual um, finger sleeves. What are we gonna call those? Cause finger fingers. <laughs> It has the little individuals, shall we, shall we call them like partial glove fingers? That you get where you have sort of tiny little individual um, finger holes that, if there's a really obvious word, by all means let me know. I mean, I will probably have thought of it by the time that it comes to you seeing this, but I don't think there's an actual word. Fingers, glove fingers, finger. I'm gonna stop saying fingers. <laughs> so, Rather than having all of these little individual ones, which frankly looked really quite fiddly to knit, I decided that what I really just wanted was one very, very long bit of ribbing that I could then fold over as my little heart desires. And so what I have is, if you allow me to put these on my hands, is I have one and... <laughs> Two, they are quite close fitting, but as you will be able to see, this one here still manages to get over at my watch, which is very, very important to me. Um, but yeah, I really, really like these. So I can, if I so choose, extend this nice cozy bit of ribbing and therefore I have little cozy fingers that I can tuck in and keep them away from any harsh or biting winds that there may be. But um, no, I absolutely love these. Let me put them up here so you can see. These are knit out of Rauma Phenol PT2 and this is a yarn that if you've watched the podcasts by Ellie and by Amy of Stranded Dye Works and the Stranded Podcast, you will have heard them rave endlessly about how fantastic this yarn is and I am absolutely no exception to that. I am definitely a convert to using this yarn and indeed I am sure that at some point there is a sweater that is destined to be knit for me out of this yarn. It is is definitely on the woollier side. It is significantly less soft than merino and perhaps some of the other base yarns that hand dyers use, but it is incredibly cozy. It has softened up quite a bit actually since I have blocked these. And similarly, the, the yarn has kind of fooled out and has plumped up a little bit because it is a woolen spun yarn and has become lovely and dense and just really quite lofty as well. And so these are going to keep me incredibly warm in the coming months. The colorways that I used are 403, which is this light gray color here, and 417 which is of course it is it's gold <laughs> it's a really pretty mustardy goldy yellow color um I did have a, a bit of a punt on these colors together um I have since ordered a shade card because as I've mentioned there is definitely a sweater in my future out of these yarns but um at the time I was choosing colors based on what I could see on the website and I think I really lucked out in terms of getting these and getting some really decent contrast with them as well but um, oh, I love these so, so much. Um, in terms of the pattern, as I mentioned, my only real modifications were lengthening the ribbing here at the top. I did use an alternating cable cast on, and I talked about that at length in uh, last week's episode because this is a cast on that I have recently um, come back to after a while, and it makes a really beautiful edge. It almost looks a bit like a sort of 
faux or, or no effort tubular cast on and for that I greatly appreciate it. But um, yeah, so I did a, an alternating cable cast on here at the top. I knit uh, 25 rows of ribbing and then completed the charge as directed on both sides and then when it came to the hem at the bottom I wanted something with a little bit of grip to it but also something that would keep them cosy and so I knit 20 rows of one by one rib, folded it over and then the same as I did with my collar here on the Siri pullover I then used a three needle bind off to stitch it back to the uh, first round of ribbing on the inside creating a folded cuff. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much these. For the most part, they were knit on 2.75 millimeter needles for the body of the um, mitts themselves. I think that's a couple of needle sizes smaller than she has you knit in the pattern, but I knew that I wanted these to be sort of fairly close fitting, quite snug, and um, it's what I had to hand. So I did, uh, the ribbing is all on two and a half millimeter needles, which is a US size one and a half I think. Yes, a US size one and a half and then the main body was knit on a US size two or a 2.75 millimeter over here in the UK. And so that's my Belisa Belusa mitts. Who knows? But um, yeah, really really cosy, really just squishy and lovely and will definitely be keeping my hands very cosy in the coming months. In terms of whips, I have, it's not quite a new cast on, but it is a recast on, and those of you who've been following me over on Instagram will have seen this already. This is my entry into our a bit vicarious knitting knit along, into our blame dungeon knit along, but this is my widow's kiss, and this is living in a project bag that I absolutely adore. This is my Space Otters project bag, I know, isn't the fabric amazing? Um, this is a project bag that was made by Sugar Tots, who is Frosted Betty over on Instagram. Sugar Tots is based out of Edmonton in Canada, and she makes some of my absolute favorite project bags. So this is a project bag. It is a decent sweater size. As you can see, it has some really pretty fabric inside. It's just giving away some of my cast on there. And um, no, I love this bag. It's lovely and kind of softly interfaced. It's really squishy. It squishes down really nicely. Definitely worth having a look at her site. She also dyes yarn and makes some really, really cute polymer clay progress keepers and stitch markers as well. So please do check out Sugar Tots over on Etsy. But living in here, as you may have already seen from that slight sneak peek, is my fledgling Widow's Kiss pullover. Now, I have shown this to you in previous weeks because I had cast this on when I was over in the US. I had gone to all of the amazing hassle of doing a full tubular cast on of all the faff and of knitting the rows and then going back and taking out my provisional cast on and just joining it all together and knitting it in the round only to discover that I had not read the fucking pattern properly. <laughs> and in fact, instead of it being all knit one, purl one, it was in fact the occasional knit twos and the occasional purl twos, all for different sections of the charts. And when I read that, I was disheartened and quite sweary and so decided that this was going to be my cast on for our knit along so that I could go back, cast it on again and alleviate my wrongs. So here we have it. Now, this is a sweater with a significant amount of positive ease, hence why it is already really quite large. Um, it's already a little bit bunched up on my needle as well, but this is a bottom-up sweater. It is by Thea Coleman. Um, I will put the pattern picture up here on the screen. You'll be familiar with it if you've been with me in previous weeks because I've talked about it at length already. Um, but yes, I have made a new start on it. I have done an alternating cable cast on, as you will hear me talk about pretty much endlessly at the moment. Um, it is actually called for in this pattern. I was just being fancy last time round when I was trying to do the full tubular cast on and I've got the fledgling starts of some of the cable patterns that are here at the very bottom and so as I start to move up you're going to see more and more of that going on but um, yes there's not much to see just at the time being. This is being knit in 
oh, just the the heavenly, heavenly squish that is Elsa wool. It is her Cormo wool. It's a worsted yarn. It's on her worsted Cormo base. It is woolen spun and it is lofty and squishy and just stunning. I love this yarn so much. It is incredibly soft. There is not the slightest chance that you will have any kind of reaction or prickle to this. I promise you it is as soft as merino. It's softer than some merinos that I've knit with. It's softer than the raw work that I used for my um, stalactite sweater and that was a merino. So um, yeah, it is just absolutely lovely and um, I would highly, highly recommend you try it. But I cast this on using a, was a 3.5 millimeter needle for the ribbing, which is a US size five, and I'm now using a six, US size six, or a four millimeter needle for the main body of the sweater. This is going to take me quite some time, and so I think for this week, I'm gonna leave it there. I'm sure that there'll be more to talk about as time moves on, but um, I anticipate you're gonna be seeing this for a good few weeks, so uh, buckle up and we'll enjoy it together. And so that's it for works in progress. It was a brief section this week. Most of my time was spent on finishing off my two finished objects. But the good news is there is ever more knitting on my horizon. A couple of patterns have come, well, one's come out this week and one has come back to my attention this week. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to talk you through those as we move into vicarious knitting. The first of those is a pattern from Ellie of Skandir, who I've mentioned already on this podcast, but um, this is a new pattern that she's just announced in collaboration with Blood at Garn, um, which is our Norwegian publication, who are bringing out an issue in English, which is fantastic, and even more so when you see some of the patterns that are included in this latest issue. One of those is a new sweater pattern from Ellie, and I'll put it up here on the screen. It is and my pronunciation is gonna leave so much to be desired, but I'm gonna go with Isbrer. It's the Isbrer pullover, I think. Um, this is, as you can see, a stunning, stunning colorwork pattern with a beautiful, slightly geometric yoke, maybe a little bit less traditional, but really, really just beautiful pattern. It's got quite a bit of positive ease built in, and it is, wait for it, Knit in Rauma Phenol PT2, the same yarn as my fingerless mitts, hence why. <clears throat> I might have ordered a colour card. Maybe. Um, this is a really, really beautiful sweater. I've had my eye on both of Ellie's garments for a while already, and seeing this has really tipped the balance, and so I'm definitely going to be looking at some colour combinations for this in the not too distant future. As I mentioned, this is being released in collaboration with Blood at Garn, which is the new issue that's coming out later on this month. So if you want to go over to Ravelry, you can purchase the full ebook right now, um, but it's worth mentioning that it will not come out until later on this month, and they'll issue a pattern update to make sure that you get a hold of it then. I am still thinking about colour combinations for it. I'm not too sure. I mean, I love the original greys that it's been knit in, but I also think it could look kind of amazing with a kind of a, a sort of dark emeraldy green main colour and then maybe a blue as the contrast. I don't know. Leave it with me and uh, I'll, I'll give it some thought. The other pattern I wanted to talk to you about this week is a pattern that's been around and released for a while. It was released as part of a hard copy publication, Making Stories Woods, last year. And uh, however, it's recently become available as a separate digital download that you can purchase separately. And so it felt like a good time to talk about it here. It is the, again, pronunciation. I'm gonna go with Sauve Bellon sweater, who knows? By Jessica Gore. Again, I'll put it here on the screen so you can interpret my noises as you will. But um, this is a really, really pretty pullover pattern. It's knit from the top down. It is um, a sport to sort of DK weight looking at the gauge, 21 stitches over four inches. So definitely got some ideas circulating um, from my stash at that point. But um, it's just a really pretty sweater. It has some cabling on the front, it's plain on the back. The fact that it's top down is definitely enticing me on the basis of slogging through my widow's kiss cast on, that being a bottom up sweater. This is seeming kind of appealing as well. Um, and so it may well be that that is in my future too. It's, um, as I mentioned, a really, really pretty sweater. It's knit 
and a DK weight, so I've definitely got some options in my stash. I am contemplating maybe a not too dissimilar colour to my Morning in Engelberg that I showed you a few weeks ago, so um, I do have other colours than gold in my stash, as you can readily see, but um, I just think that would look kind of amazing, so let's see how we go. And so the other part of our Victorious Knitting this week is going to be brought to us by you, the wonderful, wonderful podcast viewers who have been taking part in our Knit Along. I posed a question over the weekend over on Instagram, which was to say, how would you feel about perhaps showcasing some of the projects you've been working on um, and using the Blame Dundon Along hashtag on Instagram? How would you feel about showcasing those on the podcast? And the answers were, frankly, a resounding and emphatic yes. <laughs> there were very, very few people who had little interest in it and even fewer people who said they would rather I didn't use their photos. If you did answer no on that poll, rest assured, I won't be using any of your photos. But um, what I did want to do is take a chance to share some of those projects with you. Now, because I'm conscious not everyone is over on Instagram and because there's been a huge amount of activity going on within our um, thread over on Ravelry, our chatter thread on Ravelry, what I think I'm going to do is this is going to be a recurring segment where I share some of the things you've been working on, but each week I will work from either Instagram or Ravelry just to hopefully give a chance to, to everyone and um, be able to see what everyone's making across all of the different platforms we're using. This week I'll be focusing on our Instagram makers and so I've put together a little bit of a showcase of some of the things that have caught my eye. These are pretty random, ones that I've pulled out from the Blame Dungeon It Along hashtag over on Instagram and um, yes, I, I leave them to you for your delectation. <laughs> they stunning? I mean, I am just so delighted that you're all coming with me on this, taking the opportunity of casting on. So excited that you all seem to be so happy with some of the things that you're casting on, of having a chance to work on them, and just, yeah, delighted to be able to, to help to enable you to have a really bloody good time. We've already got at least a couple of finished items over in our thread, the FO thread over on Ravelry, and so please do keep those coming, although again, just to mention it is one post per person. So cast on with Wild Abandon, 
as you choose, but then obviously just make sure that when you are posting in that thread that you're editing your existing post as opposed to creating new ones as time goes on, and that way we keep it fair for everyone. And so that's it for this week. Thank you again for taking the time just to stop in and do a little bit of catching up, maybe some knitting, both vicarious and hopefully actual, with me again this week. It's been a great opportunity to stop in and have a little nosy at what some of our friends are doing as part of their knit along projects. If you'd like to see more of those, by all means, please do join us over on the Ravelry group. As I mentioned, that is the Knitting by Curiously Ravelry group, where you'll be able to see both this week's episode thread, as well as all of the Knit Along threads, and a few others as well. We have a Get Your Yarn Wishes Granted thread, and a thread that's specific to people who've never knitted a sweater before. All in all, it's proving just the most wonderful a supportive and passionate group of people and I'm really pleased to be welcoming you all into such a fantastic space. Likewise you can also follow us over on Instagram whether it is using the knitting by curiously hashtag for any and all things related to the podcast or whether it is the blamed under knit and blamed under knit along hashtags which are things related to the knit alongs themselves. As ever, you can find me as Dundernit on both Instagram and Ravelry, and it just remains for me to wish you a wonderful rest of day, a rest of week. I hope your knitting is keeping you happy and fulfilled, and if, for whatever reason, it's not, I hope you have an opportunity to knit vicariously. Keep on keeping on, knit along, and I will see you again next time. Bye. I do kind of feel like this virtuous cycle of enablement is something <laughs> that I perhaps wasn't anticipating and really should have done. It feels rather short-sighted. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the water cycle. And bear with me on this because I feel like this is something that was drummed into every single primary school child across the UK, possibly the world. <laughs> and so as analogies go, I think it's rather a good one. So you have the the designers, the patterns, the, the kind of clouds of creativity, if you like, that then sprinkle little ideas and patterns and yarns onto the ground below and those collect in pools and puddles and uh, you start to see kind of ideas and different options and then as those ideas start to become maybe fledgling projects they become little streams and then it widens out <coughs> Let me see where I'm going with this. It widens out into perhaps rivers, some of the most popular yarns, combinations, patterns, all of those things starting to come in together and you get a river that starts to flow along and it widens as you see more and more people appreciating different patterns, different ideas, and then the river starts to meander because we all know that meander is a word that is closely associated with rivers first and foremost and it twists and it turns and then you know as it gets closer and moves out towards the sea you have oxbow lakes which are very important oxbow lakes we all know how important they are we don't really understand them no we do we do because some of us had geography teachers for mothers um but <laughs> <laughs> Oxbow lakes are when the meandering of the river is such that it almost kind of then folds back in on itself and a new inlet is created, perhaps with low lying land or floodplains or all these exciting things. But essentially, you have then a main body of water and then maybe a little blip off to one side, or as you move along the river, there's a kind of larger lake area. And those are, in our analogy, those are podcasts. Yes, because those, they, they kind of feed a little bit off the creativity of the main river. Yeah. And then you have an opportunity to, I guess, kind of go in and explore that pool a little bit and then come back out and join the main body of the river. So maybe each episode is a little tiny oxbow lake and it's part of a bigger series of oxbow lakes. And um, I'm losing it now, I'm losing it. And then it, it flows out to sea, and then the sea is just kind of the world where everyone's knitting projects are, are there, kind of gloriously living together. Glorious! And then it all just becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy thing. Yeah. Today was a three coffee day. Can you tell? I think you might be able to tell. Mm -hmm.